Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. I've entitled our study of Luke chapter 12, Be on Your Guard. I broke it up into four sections. It's largely addressed to disciples. Verses 1 through 12. Be on your guard, number one, for the yeast of the Pharisees. Verses 13 through 34. Be on your guard for all kinds of greed. Verses 35 to 48. Be on your guard for his second coming. And verses 49 to 59. Be on your guard for fire on earth. Let's get to our study. Remember last week, we're in chapter 11, and it ends with Jesus just flat laying out the more stinging rebuke of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And the reason that Luke goes into such detail is because he wants us to understand why the religious establishment hated Jesus so much and persecuted him so fiercely. And so we read in verse 1 of chapter 12, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. And what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms we were proclaimed from the roofs. Right here, Luke wants us to see the incredible following that Jesus had. A crowd of many thousands. And yet he wanted to show how worldly these thousands were. They were trampling on one another. That is the world, is it not? In contrast then, he speaks first to his disciples. Now, the disciples right here, and of course we know that Luke is very careful to delineate, is certainly the twelve, the women that follow Jesus. And we also remember now that he's got 72 others that have been commissioned for the Lord's work. Amen? Amen. And so he says to all of these individuals who are going to be leaders in the kingdom, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Well, if you go back to chapter 11, we find in verse 39, Jesus talks about, with the Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. In verse 43, he says, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and the greetings in the marketplaces. In verse 44, he says, Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves. You're dead which men walk over without knowing it, and when they touch you, they become unclean, and you lead them away from God. That's what hypocrisy is. What is hypocrisy really all about? Well, it's very simply having the desire to impress men more than God. These are people pleasers. And because they want to look good on the outside, they hide things on the inside. And right here, in verses 2 and 3, Jesus lays it out. Hypocrisy is impossible with God. He knows what's going on, yes, on your outside, but also your inside. You cannot hide it. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. And God is omniscient. He knows everything about you. Are you with me right here? And it's very interesting what he says. In verse 2, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. In other words, you have a double negative, meaning Jesus is really trying to emphasize this. You cannot hide from God. You may run, but you cannot hide. Amen? Amen. Let's move on down. Verse 4. I tell you, my friends. I mean, isn't that beautiful how Jesus addresses the disciples right there? I tell you, my friends... 
Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. For so many, persecution is someone saying something bad about our church. Or maybe saying something bad about your character. Persecution for the first century disciples was all about whether or not you were going to lose your life for the cause. And Jesus lays it out right here. He says, I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. Don't be afraid of martyrdom. See, a lot of us have this idea that if we're disciples, I mean, God's just going to take care of us. I mean, we'll never get sick. We'll, we'll just have this amazing health. Nothing will ever go wrong with us. And we, well, we probably will, well, we have to die, but it won't be bad. God never promised anywhere physical well-being. That's prosperity religion that's preached on the, the television, that's preached on the Internet, that, that's falsely preached all over America, and we've been sucked into it. Jesus' Christianity was all about revolution. It was all about changing the world at the ultimate price, even, of one's life. Verse 5, but I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I, I tell you, fear him. Now, look at this, guys. In one verse, three times we're admonished by Jesus, fear God. Because he has the power to throw you into hell. Hell, or in the Greek, Gienna, is the only time it's used in the entire book of Luke. And very interestingly, it refers to the place of the dead, the place where the punished are put after the last judgment and tormented forever. Now, the vision of hell kind of comes out historically from the Jews. That's a place called the Valley of the Sons of Hanan. It's kind of a ravine, a little ways from Jerusalem, southwest of Jerusalem. And this is the place, an earlier time in Israel's history, where the wicked kings would offer child sacrifices in the flames to Baal Molech. They would kill kids as an offering to God. By Jesus' time, this had become the place of eternal fire where people would throw their trash as well as the dead criminals' bodies. And there they would be burned in the fires. What a kind of a grisly scene that's painted right there, huh? And so when he says right here, don't fear man who can kill the body. Fear God who can send your soul to eternal Guiana, to eternal hell. Now it changes the tone. And he says in verse 6, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Are not one of them? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Now, the sparrow was the diet of the poor. And so sparrows were considered insignificant birds, brought for an insignificant price. And right here, Jesus says, hey, if God the creator knows what's going on with every little sparrow out there, how much more is he concerned with your well-being? And he goes, man, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, for people like Sal and myself, that's getting easier for God. We're making it easy for the Lord right there. But that's that's how well the Lord knows us. Is that encouraging right there? 
Verse 8. Verse 8. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. Why don't we stand up and share our faith and preach Jesus Christ? Because we're scared about what men and women will think about us. We want to impress them. And Jesus is quite strong right here. He says, hey, if you acknowledge me before men, if you're preaching the word, if you're sharing your faith, he says, let me tell you something. And a vision of judgment comes. I'll be standing by God. The angels will be there as witnesses. Your name will come up. And I will say, I know Carlos Mejia, and he took a stand for me. Man, that's got to feel pretty good, isn't it? I know Ricky Challenor. This dude took it all. I know Denise Bordier. She took her stand uncompromisingly. She says, but if you disown me before men, I'll disown you before God. He's talking to disciples here, guys. This is not a once saved, always saved theology right here. He says, if you're not taking a stand for me at work, if you're not taking a stand for me at school, if you're not taking a stand for me in your neighborhood, if you're not inviting people out to church, out to Bible talk, into Bible studies, when your name is raised, I will say, I don't know the man. Because you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. Let's just get down to practicals here. When was the last time you had somebody at church? How many times have you chickened out because you didn't want to look bad? You wanted to impress men. You are a hypocrite because you didn't acknowledge Jesus. When was the last time you had people out for Bible talk? How serious do you take Bible talk? When was the last time you were in studies? Say, well, I'm just so busy. Then you are too busy, and you need to flat repent. And you know something? I think, you know, the summer's kind of come on us a little early right here. You know how the summer is? You know, we go, you know, particularly college students and high school kids. Oh, the summer, I can relax. No more work. You know, a lot of Christians get that in their minds. Oh, no more work. No, no, no. This just gives us an opportunity to work even more. Are you with me right here? But we got to just get honest with yourself. Are you a hypocrite? When was the last time you had someone to church? How serious are you about Bible talk? How many studies have you been this past week? Do you really care about people's salvation? That's what God does. Then, a passage that's puzzled people for many years. Verse 10. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But everyone who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Well, blaspheming is to speak a word against somebody. So in actuality, he's saying, everyone who blasphemes with a word, the Son of Man, Jesus, will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, so to speak, the unforgivable sin. Of course, we understand this really in the light of experience. There are all times that we chicken out. And God's saying, if you chicken out with a word, and in that sense, blaspheme Jesus, I'll still save you. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, the plan of salvation, that's what the Spirit represents. You reject my plan of salvation. It is impossible for me to save you. There is no hope. Verse 11. When you're brought before the synagogues, rulers, and authorities. Well, why would you be brought before the synagogue, rulers, and authorities? You're in trouble. 
Why are you in trouble? Because you've been preaching the word. You've been bothering people. You're causing a controversy. You're causing an uproar. Don't worry about how you'll defend yourself or what you'll say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you'll say. See, since you've not blasphemed the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's now going to talk for you. See, the Holy Spirit loves the preach. Have you ever had that feeling? You're standing in line, you're in class, you're in work, and you just get this feeling, man, I just feel compelled to share my faith with this person. That's the Holy Spirit saying, I want to go share my faith. The Holy Spirit loves to preach. And he says right here, when you come up against it, don't worry. Holy Spirit will give you the exact words to share with the authorities. Now, last week I did bring up that Lanny got arrested, right? I brought that up. I shared that to everybody. Well, it's kind of funny because... One of our brothers heard about it out in Syracuse, Andrew Smelly. And, of course, Andrew is the one that's going to be leading the D.C. mission team that's going to be sent out at our Jubilee. Is that going to be awesome, guys? And once more, we, we had a little trouble with the DMV. He had switched car insurances, but there was a, a problem at the DMV. They didn't get the switch. And so his insurance on his record looked like he had no insurance, and his registration was dropped. And when that happens, in New York at least, then your license number becomes a hot number and the police are able to spot it and, and get it. Well, lo and behold, just this past week, he's out there and all of a sudden this police car pulls him on over. He says, sir, and of course, you know, he's, he's charged with not having insurance and registration. And this is, this is right when Andrew said, you know, God, really help me right here. <laughs> Give me the words to say. And he says, you know, um, I'm a Christian. As a matter of fact, I'm a preacher. And I guess the guy was just going, mm-hmm. He said, here's what happened to me. I, I was with Geico, and I was going to something. Oh, you were with Geico? Oh, this, this happens a lot. He says, uh, Andrew goes, you know, I just don't think it's by chance we've met. I'd like to invite you out to my church. And the guy goes, you know something, you won't believe it. Before I pulled you on over, I was reading my Bible. <laughs> and uh, I'd love to come to your church. And Andrew says, well, well, not only come to my church, how about we study the Bible? And Ken said yes. They had their first study this past week. Are you with me right there, guys? You see, when, when, when you... When you get in trouble with the authorities, let the Holy Spirit preach. Don't blaspheme the Spirit, but let him preach. But bottom line, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. Point two, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now right here, we flip back to the crowds for a moment. And this guy is just so intense, he literally stops Jesus from preaching to his disciples. He interrupts them. He's just so consumed with greed. Wow. He wants his inheritance. That's all he can think about. And Jesus, listen, man. That's what I, I'm not. I'm not about being a judge over an inheritance. But I am about being a judge. And he says, you be on your guard. And watch out against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You know, I'm reminded of a phrase that became popular just a few years ago. He who dies with the most toys wins. And everybody laughed. Oh, that's witty. Yeah, and that's what we practice in America. That's what we really think. But you know, he with the most toys still dies. Let's... 
Let's read a parable that illustrates that. Verse 16. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and then I'll store all my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. What a retirement plan. That is a cranking retirement plan. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? A little irony right there. This is how it'll be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. You know, very interesting right here. There's every indication that this fella was able to reap these benefits honestly. And so you're kind of, and Jesus is the master storyteller. You kind of sucked on into this thing. He's, this is a good dude. Wow. He, uh, he got a good crop. Most people say, oh, he's been blessed by God. He's been blessed with money. He's been blessed with a good crop. And then he has a, a good problem. Well, man, what do I do? I, I don't have really, I, I've got so much abundance. I, I know, I, I'll tear down my barns and, and build bigger ones, and that way I can store all my, my grain. And then I'll say to myself, um, hey, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Uh, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. Now, in the Old Testament, the word fool has a very special meaning. It is the individual who acts without God or without wisdom in a way that could potentially destroy himself. That's a fool. And so when Jesus uses the term fool, it's much stronger than what we would in English. So this guy acted in such a way without God that it was destructive for his very being. But he wasn't dishonest. Well, let's see if we can pick up what the issue was. Well, he's blessed with the crop. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen, guys? Um, he says, well... I have no place to store my crops. Uh-oh. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and there I'll store my grain and my goods. And the New International Version says, and I'll say to myself, but the actual Greek says, and I'll say to my soul, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years, take life easy and drink your this guy was just consumed with selfishness. Life was all about him. He hoarded his will. He didn't share. Number two, life was all about how many possessions he had. And he had this feeling that everything he had was his. And God, after he tastes the guy's life, goes, well, who's going to get what you prepared for yourself? Dude, you should have been rich towards God. You know, I really want to commend the congregation. Last week, we made our weekly budget in our contribution. Amen, church? And I believe we did it because there are so many good-hearted disciples that sacrificed. And even though we're going through a pretty tough time here in this recession, I mean, I paid $4.13 for gas yesterday. Woo! Even though we went through this really hard time, you guys have been faithful to your vow. And you may not know when gas was going that price. You may not know about what was going to happen to your job. You may not know about this extra health expense. But you have been faithful, and God commends you for that. I'm encouraged by the disciples in Eugene. They're a smaller church. They just had their missions contribution. They had a 15-timeser. They had a goal of 23000 They got 27000 
I'm encouraged by the church in Phoenix. Once more, a smaller church. They had a 15 times goal for their missions contribution. Their goal was 30, they got one $31,000. I mean, this is awesome. These guys are really setting us a faith goal that we can blow out our missions contribution. Amen? Because we need to understand that, that our life is not about possessions. We need to be rich towards God. Now, look, Jesus was actually talking to the crowds here at this point, but now he turns it back to the disciples. Look at this, verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, what you'll wear. Life is more important than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap, yet they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are they, more valuable than you than birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? You know, the word worry literally in the Greek means to pull apart. And if you're a worrier, if you're an anxious person, you feel very pulled apart. You know what I'm talking about right here? And that's what worry literally means. And he says right here, he says, if you're rich towards God, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat and drink. And then he says, consider the ravens. Now, ravens are unclean birds. And he's contrasting that to the disciples. You're clean because of the blood of Jesus. Amen, guys. Amen. But if God is taking care of the unclean ravens, these birds, how much more will he take care of those who have been cleaned by the blood of Jesus Christ? He says, and besides that, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? The irony there, worrying takes away your life, right? You get a heart attack. It's called a type A personality right there. He says, worrying doesn't change a thing. It just wrecks up your spiritual life. It just pulls you apart. Keep reading. Verse 27. Consider how the lilies grow. Now, you know, it's such, he had this, this, such an intense parable of this guy having his life going really great and then... Whammo! <laughs> he gets taken out. And the Lord says, you know, we need to change the pace right here. We need to go to kind of a pastoral feel. We need birds. We need some flowers right here. Let's, 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 let's chill. And consider how the lilies grow. <laughs> you got to admit it. You know, when you consider... I don't know if you've done it very often, but if you consider the growing of lilies, it's a, it's a very chill thing. As a matter of fact, the lilies that Jesus was most likely talking about were purple anemones, very, very popular over there. And I, I knew Michael Underhill would know that. And of course, these particular flowers were purple in paralleling them to, he says, yet I tell you not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Why? Kings are in purple, right? And he goes on down, and he says in verse 28, if that is how God clothes the grass, the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, or you little faith? Oop, little rebuke right there. <laughs> See, grass is always transitory in the Bible, Old Testament and New. Lasts a short time. The fire that he talks about, Grass was used for burning in the oven, for, for cooking. It says, man, grows one day, in the fire the next. Kind of like your life. Amen. <laughs> Verse 29. <laughs> and do not set your heart on what you are to eat or drink. Don't worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, all these things will be given you as well. Well, these words sound so familiar, but a little changed. A little changed. We're very familiar with the, the Matthew passage, are we not? And in the Matthew passage, he says that the pagans run after all these things. Well, if you preach much, if you've led very many Bible talks, you know how sometimes you, you lead the same Bible talk, but you change it up just a smidgen? Well, that's what happened right here. Jesus changed a different sermon. And this particular time, he talks about the pagan world. Now, remember who's writing this? Luke, who's trying to get the message out that Jesus came to save the whole world, Jews and Gentile. So he's emphasizing, hey, the whole pagan world goes after these things. And then it says right here, 
But your father knows you need them. I mean, if he knows about sparrows, if he knows about ravens, if he's, you know, taking care of the lilies and the grass, hey, how much more than you? But notice this in verse 31. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. You know, when I first read that, I, I said, you know, it's not as punchy as Matthew's text. But seek first his kingdom. But, you know, I thought about it a second. I said, no, no, no. You know something? This is much more hard-hitting. Matthew simply has the kingdom as a priority. Luke says, it's all there is. He says, what is your kingdom out? Just seek the kingdom. That's what life is all about. Just seek the kingdom. And then this is cool right here. Verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock. It's that it's awesome. I mean, the Lord, the Lord has that compassionate and tender side to him. This is in contrast to the crowd that's trampling on each other, you know. Hey, little flock. Of course, it also emphasizes the fact that it's little. There aren't many people whose life is all about the kingdom. Now, remember, he's talking to people who call themselves disciples. That's you and me here this morning. He's not talking about the world. For the most part, this passage is talking to disciples. There is no such thing as once saved, always saved. you got to check it out. He says, don't be afraid, little, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give it to the poor, that's alms. Provide purses for yourselves so that you'll not wear out a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, I got a rather disturbing tea time with uh, Carlos and DJ this week. They weren't disturbing, but they were disturbed. And they came to talk to me about the fact that half the married men in the Hollywood region, not the single guys, but half the married men in the Hollywood region were not at midweek. So where were they at? Well, one went to a Laker game. Couple, you know, job, you know, I had to be out of town. Others had some things come up. Now, from time to time, there'll be something that will prevent you from coming, but not as a, a practice. You see, how different than the story that Omar Valdovinas told at staff meeting. This past weekend, Sonia and Victor Gonzalez, as well as the Valdovinos, Omar and Selena, went to Chicago for the Latin Festival there. And I heard it was awesome. But Omar was just taken aback. He says, you know, I, I got it. Guys, I, didn't, I have taken the L.A. church so much for granted he says, there is this one sister. She's very poor. She has two young daughters. And when she heard I was one of the guys from the City of Angels Church, she just came up to me. And she says, I can't wait to get out to the Jubilee. I've been saving and saving and saving so that my daughters and me could come. Because we've heard all about the City of Angels Church, and we just can't wait to be there for the fellowship. See, that's a person that's seeking the kingdom. Do you see a difference between that and the guys didn't come midweek? See, life is about the kingdom. But even in the kingdom, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Let's keep moving. Third point. Be on your guard for his second coming. Verse 35. That, even when you say it, you go, okay, that's a good point. Amen. I'm convicted. Let's go. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Verse 35. Remember, he's talking to the disciples. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. So that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for them. It'll be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at a table and will come and wait on them. 
It'll be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. There's a lot here. The New National Version kind of glosses over it. The actual Greek at the beginning says, gird up your loins for service and keep your lamps burning. Well, you know, back in the olden days, you know how people used to wear all the, the long robes and everything? And so what he meant by girding up your loins is that you can't, you can't really act fast if you've got these long robes. I mean, you know, it's amazing in Star Wars. You're able to do the, the, the whole thing right here, you know what I mean, You're talking about? But they had to gird up the loins. They had to take the edge of the robe and, and stick it in the belt. You know, you saw this with Elijah when he had to run, and, and you know, even the Passover meal is to be eaten in that way. You've got to be ready to act. Secondly, he said, Keep your lamp burning. Well, what do, you, what do you need a lamp for? To see where you're going. That means you're going to be moving. Where? Into the darkness. He says, you got to be ready. Why? He tells the story of this master with these servants, and the master goes away to this wedding banquet. Now, different than in our day, a wedding banquet could last four, five, seven, eight days, and many times you didn't even know how long the wedding banquet was going to be. That could be expensive, amen, guys? But the point being is, the master expected the servants to keep on doing what he'd asked them to do, whether he was there, and especially when he came on back. Well, that's the whole point. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. And then he's saying, hey, guys, I expect you to keep doing what I've taught you to do, and I expect to find that to be happening when I come on back for the second coming. Are you with me right there? Now, the real cool thing right here, we don't have time to get into it. The really neat thing, it says that, is that he's going to be so fired up to find faithful servants that it, it says in verse 37, I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at the table and come and wait on them. In other words, Jesus is going to be serving us, those who are faithful when he returns. Is that cool or not? And then he talks about he says, you've got to be ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. Well, of course, in the Roman watches of the night, it starts at 6 p.m. and goes to 6 a.m. There are four watches. So he says, it doesn't make a difference whether he comes at 9 p.m. or 3 p.m. Amen? It may be at a convenient time. It may be an inconvenient time. You just never know when the master is going to come, but you've got to be ready. Another quick parable. Verse 39, but understand this, if the owner of a house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. He's obviously talking about someone that's away on travel. And while he was away on travel, this thief comes. And he's saying, hey, if you knew the thief would come, you'd have hung around so you could chase the thief off. I still remember back, I think it was about 1986, we were at the World Missions Conference there in Boston. We just had the most incredible time. I come back, and I find, me and Lena open up our house, and our whole house has been ransacked. A thief had come. Man. And I was going, man, I wish I knew when that thief was coming, because I had chased them on off right there. But, of course, you don't know. That's what the thief does. You just don't know when he's coming. i got to ask you, are you ready for Jesus' second coming right now? You know, i, I got to be honest. When I study this passage, I go, you know something? I just haven't preached that very much, the second coming of Jesus. You know, there are two ways we're going to leave here, guys. Either we die or the second coming. I'd rather go second coming. I'm going to preach that a lot more. I think that's encouraging. 41. Peter asks, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? When I hold it. What's he talking about? I mean, obviously, this statement's important. Luke includes it. Lord, are you telling this parable to us, the disciples, or to everyone in the world? Or is Peter saying, are you telling this parable to us, the 12 apostles, the leaders, or to everyone, all the other disciples? Well, let's just see what the text says. Verse 42. The Lord answered. Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? Aha, there it is. He's talking about the leaders, isn't he? 
The role of the leaders is to take care of the other servants of Jesus. So he's talking about the church leadership right here, the future leadership in the kingdom. Verse 43, it'll be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master's taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the men's servants and the maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour that he's not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. This is not meek and mild Jesus talking right here. This is not the guy holding the little lamb. This is a side of Jesus a lot of people don't know about. Remember, he's not talking to the world right here. He's not really even addressing disciples. He's talking to the leadership. And he's saying, hey, if you are not ready, if you're not looking forward to the second coming, if you're not taking care of the other servants, you're going to start to drift away in the worldliness and then the sin. And when I come back, you'll be assigned a place with unbelievers. You will lose your salvation. See, a lot of people think, well, I'm a leader, I'm a leader, so I'm, 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 I'm guaranteed to be saved. Nope. Now, the Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. You've got to be right towards God. And you can wear whatever title you want. That doesn't save you. It's what your heart is all about towards God. I just got to ask you, are you ready? If Jesus came back today, says, yes, take me, Lord. I'm ready. Or if you're not, you need to repent. Are you with me right here? Let's go on. Verse 47. The servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. Okay, so he's talking about leaders right here. And he's, he's saying, in essence, he says, for those that have knowledge and experience, and you don't do what God wants you to do, you're going to be beaten with a ton of blows. If you don't really know, then there'll be less blows, which is very interesting right here because Jesus then is talking about degrees of judgment and degrees of punishment, much like Matthew talks about in the parable of the talents, degrees of reward. And of course, in some respects, if you think about it, if God's a fair God, if there indeed is a heaven and a hell, it's going to be a worse hell for those that knew what they needed to do. And it's going to be a more glorious heaven, that's treasures in heaven, being rich towards God, for those that worked hard to save souls, right? Look what he says right here. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. You know, the Bible simply says, to whom much is given, much is expected. That's God's mindset is that your mindset. You know, we have a lot of people in the congregation that have been disciples a real long time, have a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, and a lot of talent, but they're not even Bible talk leaders. To whom much is given, much is expected. God expects our lives to be all about the kingdom. What does it mean to be all about the kingdom? When you have knowledge, experience, and talent, if you're really ready for Jesus' second coming, you want to take as many as possible with you. You're going to want to be a leader. You know, for the young in the faith, I challenge you, aspire to being a Bible talk leader, a house church leader, an evangelist, a deacon, an elder. For those of you that have been around a long time and have experience, knowledge, and talent, then I call you to repent. Because to whom much is given, much is expected. You know, I can't help but think about a dear brother of mine up in Portland. He's an elder up there, 54 years old, Greg Goman. And Greg has lupus, and for, if a male has lupus, it's almost always fatal. 
And, um, you know, he just talked to me this week. He says, oh, bro, did you hear I went into the hospital? I go, oh, bro, I feel terrible. No, I, I didn't. He says, bro, it was, oh, a tough ordeal. But I know it was from God. See, a lot of us think, oh, no, I'm sick. I'm hurting. I have this problem. I have this challenge. Satan's after me. You know, for every move that Satan makes, God is involved in that same move. See, what happened is that Greg has started to pass blood in his urine. It's very dangerous. It could, it could be an indicator of many bad things. When they went on in, you guys have heard of a kidney stone, right? Those, I, I've never had one, but I, they're, they're really tiny, and they hurt like heck, I understand. He didn't have a kidney stone. He had something fairly rare, a bladder stone. The size of a baseball. When they took it out, he weighed less. But the question came, why did God allow this man with lupus, an elder who's been serving him so much to be? Well, he had two roommates in the hospital recovery. He shared his faith with one and wasn't open. But he shared his faith with the other, a guy named Rob. And they had a Jesus Bible study. Rob then made sure his girlfriend Mary came on in and had a study. And now they're studying the Bible. Also, uh, a guy in the unit across from them, a guy named Paul, had been put in there for just a horrific burn. He worked on roads. And there was a, a very bad accident that, that hot tar came all over his hand and his arm. So bad that it, that it melted his watch into his skin. He came on in. It was all bandaged and everything. And Greg says, listen, you need God. Let's pray for you. Let's pray for healing. They took the bandages on off, and the doctors were stunned at the healing that had taken place just a couple of days. You see, it was absolutely of God that that evil of Satan was used by God to give Greg an opportunity to unleash the kingdom into those people's lives. You see, Greg is ready for his second coming. Amen? Amen. Let's finish this on off. Be on your guard for fire on earth. Verse 49. I have come to bring fire on earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it's completed. Well, we understand fire on earth means judgment, right? Amen, guys? And Jesus said, man, I wish it was kindled. I wish it was already stoked. But before the judgment can really take place, I have a baptism to undergo. That's his death. I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it's completed. Because he knew he had to die in order for the world to live. Verse 41. Do you think that I came to bring peace on the earth? No. I tell you, but the vision. From now on, there will be five and one family divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. They'll be divided. Father against son. Son against father. Mother against daughter. And daughter against mother. mother Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. And daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Right here, Jesus pictures a family of five. A married couple with a son who's married. And they also have a daughter, five people. And he says, when I come, judgment will come. People will have to make decisions. And understand this little flock. I have come to be fire on earth. There's a baptism I must undergo. And it will call people to the most important decision of their life. But don't get faked out. Just because you decide to be reconciled to God does not mean that you will keep your most treasured earthly relationships. There may be a price. The price may be division. But think about it. The only hope for those that don't decide is that you stay faithful to Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's keep moving right here. He said to the crowd, When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? 
He says, man, you guys, you can look at the sky, you can feel the wind, and you know exactly what's going to happen. He says, but you can't interpret the ultimate sign, which is the advent of Jesus proclaimed through the miracles and wonders and signs that he did. The advent of Jesus into human history is the singular most important event of all humankind. And he's saying, you're blind to it. You can't interpret. You don't see it. Why? Because you don't want to see it. So then he ends up like this. Why don't you judge for yourselves what's right? As you go in with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled to him on the way, or you may drag you off to the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. And I tell you, you'll not get out until you've paid the last penny. He's not talking about another human being right here. He's talking about God. God is the adversary, or another translation, the accuser. And he says, listen, before you hit the prison, because you owe God a debt. He's talking about debtor's prison here. He says, before you go to prison, try really hard to get reconciled to him on the way. Because if you don't get reconciled, if you don't appreciate what the blood of Jesus has done for you, you're going to be tossed into prison. And look, look at this. And you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. Well, there's a catch there. The only way you get out of debtor's prison is for family or friends to pay the money debt. You can't work from prison. And so what Jesus is saying, if you get tossed into prison... You can't work out that debt. You are eternally condemned because you haven't appreciated the debt that's been paid for you. You know, I hope that you get a chance to read the bulletin this week about uh, Kyle becoming an evangelist. Amen, guys? And it, it's, it's a great story. But you know, Kyle wasn't always an evangelist. Kyle was, he was a pagan's pagan. He's a college student at the University of Hawaii Hilo, and he was the big man on camp. He was the, he was the basketball star for the team. And as fate would have it, and God would want it, he gets reached out to in the middle of his sophomore year. They study the Bible. This guy named Chris Tevis studies with him. Kyle hears it. And he goes, this is not for me. <laughs> and so he runs. Now, you got to understand, University of Hawaii Hilo is a pretty small campus, about 3,000. And Chris Tevis was out there every day. And so Kyle had to always be watching for him <laughs> about where he's at. So if he'd see him, he goes, he'd go the other way. Or he'd, he'd hide in the bushes, you know. <laughs> he just didn't want to come in contact with him. Well... Kyle's life got more and more messed up. Got kicked out of the dorms for partying. Kyle loved to have fist fights. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle was a drunkard. Kyle was a womanizer. It was so bad. His non-Christian dad sat down with him. And he says, boy, we need to have a talk. And he laid him out. What the heck are you doing with your life? Well, Kyle stops drinking, finds Chris Tevis, and gets baptized. A couple months later, his father wants to talk to him again. He says, son, what's happened to you? Why aren't you out there with the guys? Doing what the guys do. Having a good time. I'm really concerned about you, son. <laughs> of course, one month after Kyle was baptized, his brother Evan was baptized. Two years later, his brother Levi was baptized. And so in that house with his sister, it's three to three. But now the kingdom is giving hope to the parents and the sister. You see... Kyle is all about the kingdom. 
In order to come over here and train for the ministry, he and Joan took out a home equity loan for $20,000 so he could come and train. And when that money ran out two months ago, he started washing cars with Adolfo just to put food on the table. This is a guy that says, listen, i got to finish out my training. i got to do it. And then next Sunday, he gets to be appointed evangelist in the kingdom of God. Amen. Next Sunday, next Sunday, the Holy Spirit is sending out him and Joan, not back by themselves, but with a team of eight other disciples that are going to plant the church there in Honolulu with a remnant group of 15 that are waiting. And oh yes, his brother Evan is now the preacher at the Hilo Church. How about it? Are you on your guard for fire on earth? Do you realize the call of God is simply this? Seek the kingdom. Whether it be financially, time-wise, or your heart, it's all about being on your guard. Because your heart is the wellspring of life. Thank you. God bless.